In this lecture, we will be discussing celiac disease, which is a condition that has caught a lot of attention with the public recently. There are many organizations and peer support groups for patients with celiac disease. Uh, one thing to note for this lecture, we will only be discussing the evidence-based practice. We will not be touching on any of the controversies associated with this condition. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disease. When we study the immune system, we mentioned that we have certain adaptive immunity, which allows our body to develop defense against certain foreign invaders, whether they are a virus or something else. It is very important for our immune system to be able to recognize anything foreign, especially to those things we have had previous exposure and then can quickly launch an immune response so that we can contain the invasion and recover from it. However, sometimes our immune system has improper recognition. For some reason, the system thinks that part of our own tissue in the body is foreign. Therefore, our, tissue, our own tissue becomes the target of the immune response. So this is when we say that the patient has developed an autoimmune disease. And this can be a very tricky situation. So if we think about the immune response triggered by an infection, um, maybe a certain bacteria, this is a real invasion by a microorganism. If we can then identify it, we can use antibiotics to kill it and cure the disease. However, this, in this case, the autoimmune diseases are not caused by infection. They are instead caused by improper recognition of our own tissue as the target. Therefore, we do not have medications to kill the target issue like we did with the antibiotics to kill the bacteria. And this makes sense because we wouldn't want to be targeting our own tissue. Therefore, this is a very challenging disease to manage. Some data indicates that 5 to 7% of adults in Europe and North America are affected by different types of autoimmune diseases. It seems that different racial backgrounds associated with certain genetics have different prevalence of autoimmune diseases. And the immune and the autoimmune disease could be organ specific, meaning it only affects certain organs. So if we remember, our immune system can identify very specific markers for certain targets. In this case, perhaps only the cells in that organ that have the marker or antigen that our immune system is recognizing and targeting. Then there are also cases where the um, autoimmune diseases are non-organ specific, so it may be affecting more than one type of tissue. And genetics does pay, play an important role. We mentioned that people with different racial backgrounds are affected by different autoimmune diseases. So this here is the general background on autoimmune disease, so now let's get into celiac disease. Again, it is an autoimmune disease, and by this we know that it is something that is not caused by an infection. Instead, it is an attack on the small intestine by our own immune system. This attack and damage is the result to exposure from gluten. Um, and this is something that is present in certain grain products. Many autoimmune diseases are tricky because we don't know much about the trigger and the genetic background. However, as far as celiac disease is concerned, we do know quite a bit about the condition. For example, we know exactly what triggers the immune response. This is the exposure to gluten. And we have also identified genes associated with celiac disease. So we have a certain genetic background to interact with gluten to trigger this autoimmune response. This is nice. We know a lot about the disease already, and this can help us manage the condition. A 
about 1% of the general population is affected by celiac disease worldwide. Specific etiology is that from wheat, rye, malt, and barley, these grains and their products contain alpha-glidin, which is a protein that is a component of gluten. And some people with certain genes do not respond to gluten very well. As a result, the small intestine is the target of the immune response triggered by gluten. This causes the tissues of the small intestine to be infiltra infiltrated by white blood cells. And as we mentioned, white blood cells can go to the location where they are needed. And in this case, the target is the small intestine, so the white blood cells will congregate there. Also, as part of the immune system, our body generates antibodies. In this case, it is the IgA antibodies. And if we remember, there are five types of immunoglobulins, and IgA is the one involved in celiac disease. For consequences of celiac disease, because the small intestine becomes the target of the immune response, over time the villi will become damaged and destroyed by the immune response. We know that villi are the finger-like structures protruding into the lumen of the small intestine, and on the lining of these villi cells we have the microvilli. Both structures serve the purpose of increasing surface area available for digestion and absorption. Thus, it is critical for us to maintain these structures. However, when we have the damage done in celiac disease, we can see here how the microvilli and villi have become flattened. Over here, we have the normal structure and we can see these finger-like protrusions of the uh, villi cells. This is how it should normally look. But over here, it's pretty flat. So um, Besides just seeing the flattening of the villi cells, we also see that a lot of cells have these uh, very dark nucleus. It's a lot darker over here compared to this, uh, the normal uh, intestinal cell. So when we have the infiltrations of the white blood cells, we have to remember many of them have very prominent nuclei. And so that's what we're seeing over here um, with the celiac disease. And then, of course, it would make sense if we have damage to the cells that we would have decreased enzyme function, and we mentioned the decreased surface area as well. So with these two changes, then we can predict that people with celiac disease would have maldigestion as well as malabsorption. Celiac disease is often accompanied by other autoimmune disorders. For example, many children diagnosed with celiac disease are also diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Other coexisting autoimmune diseases include rheumatoid arthritis, or RA, as well as certain thyroid diseases, and also um, SLE also uh, just known as lupus. So lupus is a condition that can affect the kidneys and lead to serious damage to the organ, specifically the glomeruli structure. Um, many patients also may have specific red marks that develop on their face um, from the inflammation of the skin. And statistics show that people with celiac disease are at higher risk of developing lymphoma and osteoporosis. 
And of course, if celiac is not well managed over a long period of time, the severe complications we will see um, of malnutrition and nutrient deficiencies. Clinical signs and symptoms include diarrhea. You know, we have the mal digestion, malabsorption. So we have the undigested, unabsorbed nutrients staying in the lumen of the intestine. And this will pull the water into the lumen and lead to diarrhea. We also have cramping, abdominal pain, and bloating. Those would all be understandable. So once the unabsorbed nutrients reach the colon and the bacteria gets a hold of them, they produce a lot of gas through fermentation. Some patients may also complain of bone and joint pain, muscle cramping, fatigue, and peripheral neuropathy, seizures, etc. Um, skin rash, as we mentioned in the last slide, is also a common complaint of celiac patients. So this over here is a picture of a common um, type of skin rash, the dermatitis herpetiformis um, that often manifests in celiac disease. And these people may also have mouth ulcerations. Although celiac disease is triggered by something in the small intestine, with it being exposed to gluten, so this is where we have the autoimmune response beginning, it could definitely affect tissues that are far away from the GI tract. So some people may not even realize that their diarrhea is being caused by celiac disease. They actually end up going to the doctor to seek treatment for a skin rash, and then once they find out they have these other symptoms, the GI symptoms, um, they may start looking towards celiac disease as being the cause. So biopsy of the small intestinal mucosa is the, st the gold standard for diagnosing celiac disease. We mentioned that the damage done by the condition will lead to flattened villi, so this can be seen on the biopsy tissue, but obviously this is an invasive procedure. Before even having a biopsy, we may have a good idea of what the condition is because if the patient follows the gluten-free diet um, and the symptoms resolve, then it would be a clear sign that they are likely a celiac patient. Also, due to the autoimmune nature of the condition, we have serum markers that we can check. For example, as we discussed the autoimmune antibodies, the uh, IgA. The prognosis of the condition depends on how well the patient can manage excluding gluten from their diet. If a patient has good compliance following the gluten-free diet, over time the villi height could become normalized and this could allow for the maldigestion and malabsorption to resolve. Then all of the physical and physiological signs and symptoms could be reduced if not completely disappear. If we have the refractory celiac disease, um, usually it's because either the diet is contaminated with gluten, but we don't know the source of it, so we're not able to remove it, or because there are coexisting diseases. We can easily monitor and evaluate uh, because if the symptoms such as diarrhea persist, then either the patient is still getting gluten from unknown sources or there is something else going on in the system and we would need to do further assessment to see if we can identify the triggers. For the nutrition assessment, we need to assess for anthropometric changes, both in adults and children, because the this disease leads to severe maldigestion and malabsorption, so it could definitely affect weight. And in children, of course, it could affect their growth rate. Nutrient imbalances is obvious uh, due to this as well. 
We also need to check social networks, knowledge and beliefs, and dietary adherence. Eventually, patients need to know what foods and food products contain gluten. This does take education so that they can have this knowledge when they go out to buy things to cook for themselves or if they are dining out at restaurants. Then for the nutrition diagnosis, problems usually include inadequate intake, impaired nutrient utilization, and altered GI function. For intervention, gluten-free is key. We have to go on the gluten-free diet. Other factors here, low residue, low fat, lactose-free, all of these could also help control the GI symptoms. Through patient education, they should know uh, what grain products contain gluten and how to identify these based on reading the food labels. They will really need to practice this on a daily basis. Luckily, right now, at least in this country, gluten-free products are widely available and easy to get. As we mentioned, there are also many peer support groups for celiac patients, along with many good websites available. So they are able to check out what is out there and provide helpful tips to each other. One thing we should caution patients of is that they will need to find other sources of whole grains to provide those carbohydrates and nutrients in their diet, but they also have to pay attention to what is replacing those gluten-containing grains. We don't want them choosing unhealthy replacement foods. For example, say in a vegetarian diet, the meal may not have red meat, but if instead they added a lot of cheese, you know, for protein, then also the fat intake would be increased and maybe not make that particular vegetarian dish such a healthy choice. And we often see this with gluten-free products having high, um, containing high amounts of fat and sugar to try and overcome the texture difference from not having the gluten in there. Uh, the textbook provides a very comprehensive list of the gluten-free diet. Please study this on your own. And that big table in the textbook is also included on the next few slides. So please keep this for your records. It could be very helpful in patient education. And it's also good study material for dietitians.